everyone, welcome back to CPL Fever. It is Jack Murray here along with Andrew Murray. And today we are joined by managing consultant of York 9, Angus McNabb. Thank you so much, Angus, for coming out to sit with us. And how is your day today? It's not been too bad today. Um, a lot going on as ever, uh, but we're just trying to keep going and uh, keep the momentum up right now. And I also wanted to say, I love your background. It is amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, we've all got a little bit of a journey and how we get here. Mine's no different to uh, anyone else. And there's a few twists and turns. And when you uh, plan these things, I think if you drew it up, you'd never end up in the same place. So, uh, yeah, just delighted now to be working with York Nine and uh, for the Border Zara family. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, good way of putting it. And I have heard a lot of people saying that your laptop is the most coveted piece of technology in the Canadian Premier League. So do you think that it is true? Um, probably not. And there's probably a lot of people in the analytics community laughing um, because they're much smarter than me. Lots of uh, people who can code, can model, can make a lot more sense of the data than I can. Um, but I think it's just about uh, any business and, and being smart and making decisions based on evidence and uh, taking a structured approach to how we do things. There are certainly data and analytics elements of that. But uh, I'm by no means the brains, and uh, my laptop's running on fumes right now anyway, so I'm not sure it's that coveted. So, yeah, I had a question, Angus. So how did you get, uh, how did you fall in love with soccer? Um, just like most kids growing up, um, my dad's from uh, Dundee, and his his entire life was sort of soccer growing up. He used to uh, dance park with his brother, with his dad, and uh, it was his local club. Um, we were, I grew up, spent most of my time growing up in his job, but um, going to Dens Park with my, my dad, my uh, uncle was one of the, the best things that was about going back to Scotland on holiday. Um, and I always remember the sort of the, the trips to uh, the club shop in Dundee and sort of uh, into the little shopping centre it used to be in and, and everything there, the, these small little memories and attachments to the game. Um, and so, yeah, D Dundee was my local club, as it were, but local from distance um, or, or my family club. Um, and then living in London, I um, was a big fan of Arsenal as well. I um, was very fortunate that dad's job meant he had a client that had a box there. Oh, and really? uh, so I managed, uh, managed to go and see a few games at the old Highbury. Uh, and that was my first introduction to things. Okay. And also, the new kits um, ca went, came out pretty recent, recently, the new 2020 home kit. So what do you think about those? The 2020 home, um, I'm biased, but I think we've got one of the best, if not, well, I think we have the best uh, home jersey in the league. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the relationship we have with Macron's fantastic, where we're not sort of uh, adapting uh, park kits that anyone can buy. Um, and sticking a badge and sticking a logo on. There really is a, a huge degree of customization and uh, hopefully it will be a feature that in years to come fans will get to see, but uh, the owners and um, the sort of the commercial and, and marketing leads from the clubs actually travel out to Macron in Italy, uh, work with their designers and, and sit and design the kit over the course of a couple of days. So it is a, a really, really phenomenal partnership with Macron that means fans of all teams in the league get product that's unique to them and celebrates their town, their heritage, their fandom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually, I don't know if you, if you saw it, but we ranked uh, the kids. We gave uh, York nine second place. Um, yeah. and, and I think, I think the, the one deciding factor for me was, um, you know, we gave it to the Wanderers because I don't know if there's ever been a sound wave on a, on a kit before. And I just thought that was a, a wild idea, but um, yeah, it's very cool. I think uh, Derek and the guys up at the Wanderers do a phenomenal job. I was lucky enough last season um, to travel up and see uh, the Wanderers play against Pacific. Um, it was the midweek game, the Wednesday night game at your place. And while it wasn't the greatest uh, game that night, um, it was just a brilliant occasion and uh, loved my time in Halifax. Had a great time. Uh, Derek and uh, Stephen took us out for a couple of beers afterwards, along with uh, Dean Shillington, the owner at Pacific, and uh, we had a really, really uh, good bit of fun up there. It's a, a great spot. Nice. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, so 
as the management consultant, what management consultant does? Yeah, so um, effectively I, I'm sort of overseeing both the uh, on and off field side of the club right now. So that means on the on the pitch working with uh, Jimmy Brennan, our head coach, um, who we've just extended his contract and um, sort of really defined his role as technical director as well. So working with Jimmy on recruitment, scouting, um, yeah. salary cap management, and really, really setting out the, the long-term future and what we want to do there. Um, yeah. I think last year it was year one for the entire league. So everyone yeah. had a very, very real need to focus on the immediate um, and the now. And what we're trying to do is really set the table, set the agenda for future years so that we're in a very stable, comfortable position. If there's a player that we want comes on the market, we're able to go and get him because we've been smart with how we allocate resources. We've been smart with the contracts we sign. And um, you might see my eyes go that way. I've got my uh, sort of board with all of my player names and uh, magnets and everything that I move around back there and what we're really doing with uh, salary and salary cap and what that looks like should we extend guys out, not just into 2021, but um, we're looking at things and contract options all the way up to the 2023 season at this point. Okay. And you were talking about scouting. So what is York 9 scouting process in Canada and internationally? So within Canada, I'm very, very fortunate that I've got um, Jimmy Brennan, Paul Stolteri and uh, Camille, uh, our, our sort of goalkeeping coach, uh, our assistant coach there. They know the market as well as, if not better than anyone. Uh, Jimmy is experienced in the J, um, not only with the Toronto first team, um, but also within their academy. It means that he has a phenomenal network. It's, it's his backyard. It's where he grew up. Um, and and really, Ontario and, and the GTA is is Canada's nursery for soccer. I think mm -hmm. when you look at it, I think about 60% of uh, Canadian men's national team players have come out of the the sort of the GTA and wider Ontario area. So we have to have our, pul our finger on the pulse on that and look for the best available talent at all times. Internationally, mm -hmm. what we look at is we, we just try and see what the best available players would be um, within the constraints we face. So salary, we're not mm -hmm. going to be paying particularly high transfer fees or, or anything else at this moment in our evolution. Um, yeah. So it's just piecing things together where we look at um, some players much following on from the 21st club project, um, but the league mm -hmm. is looking at players that are young um, and have high upside. So. I'm always looking for players that have resale value for the club. Yeah. And how that works for us is that we actually have a contract over and above um, the standard project with the 21st club that the, the league took out. Um, I think I've said in a couple of other interviews, Blake Worcester and Omar, who founded the 21st club, I've known for years and years through my time at Opta. Um, mm -hmm. And they were one of my first phone calls when I took the job on. So working with those guys, we really, really get a, a good gauge, not only on what we're doing in the recruitment stuff through their tool acquisition, um, but it also helps me with my long-term roster planning, salary cap management. Um, when we get into the season, my player bonuses based on appearances, minutes, um, goals, assists, all of that kind of stuff are uh, worked out using sort of the cross-referencing in, in tables of their software and what we input from our player contracts as well. So it's a, a scouting and salary cap management system we use there. Um, we use Instat, as most clubs in the CPL do, for all of our video footage around the world um, to get a, a real look on players. And then again, we all have pretty good uh, networks to verify and fact check and see who, what might be available above and beyond uh, the information we're getting from data and pictures. So. We want to know if someone's going to be a, a good member of the team when they come into the environment. All of that kind of information is is really important to us as well. So mm -hmm. a lot of different parts that sort of form a, a, a bigger puzzle. Um, we also use a company called uh, Smarter Scout that a friend of mine here in New York, Dan Altman, founded. Um, 
And that's actually an app that anyone can download and play on and have a little look at players from around the world and uh, their data statistics, what they're doing there. So, um, yeah, Smarter Skirt that Dan founded is a, another interesting tool for us um, as well. We're not Man City. We're not Liverpool. We're not able to buy the vast quantities of data that they do from Okta or Statsbomb or any of these sort of larger consultancies. So we have to look at um, things that sit within our budget, um, yet allow us to develop competitive advantage. And, and are you focusing you just... on? Uh, are you focusing on certain areas in your in your international scouting, or? So there are there are naturally some areas that um, work better than others for a number of different reasons. Um, one, just volume of players um, for us to look at and go after. Uh, I think Brazil has the highest number of professionals playing around the world. And if you look at, um, I think it's, I always get this acronym wrong, but I always find it no problem on the internet. It's CIES. Um, it's like the, the, the International Footballers Observatory. Um, they produce reports every year. And some of those reports on player movement and migration, um, I always look at, to look at trends and, and just see is there, uh, untapped or particularly sort of en vogue markets really right now um, because that's got good resale value for me. If I can take someone from one of these popular countries um, and then move them on, that would be particularly interesting for uh, clubs across Europe and, and other areas of the world. Um, the other thing that we look at is also just uh, being very pragmatic and looking at uh, particularly the current situation. Um, as and when borders open up, um, what's the likely processing time on uh, work permit applications and things like that. So work permits from the US, Mexico, Europe, um, much easier um, for us as a professional soccer club to turn around and work through than some of the uh, South American countries. Sure. Um, now, I heard that you mentioned uh, York 9 has one main goal, one main vision. Uh, can you share a little bit about, about that with us? Yeah, so effectively, the when I came into the club, I felt that where we sat with um, having a, a club and a technical philosophy didn't work separately. Um, we had to unify everything and pull it together. So we actually sort of we have one objective, and that and that's to sort of ultimately to win. And, and what does to win mean for us? That means sort of living by and, and how will we win? we'll win by following our sort of new vision, mission and values. So effectively, the uh, mission and, and what we're trying to do as a club, um, the mission is pretty simple in that we make memories. Um, we want memories that last a lifetime and are based on authenticity, beauty and, and pure joy that football brings. So how are we going to do that? Um, we have a set of core values that we live by um, and it's four core values. They all set up on the website for everyone to see. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's about really a mindset and, and sort of judging our work by these values and, and what we're doing to, in some ways, be united as a club, be joyful, find these aspects that really celebrate what we're, we're looking to do, not be scared of change, adapt and, and have a real startup mentality. But within that, the overall vision um, piece of the club is that we, we want Canadians to aspire to dream bigger. Um, we want to think on a global level and be measured on a global standard. Um, we don't just want to be the best in the CPL. We want our marketing team to be highlighted by clubs around the world in this is genuine best practice for what we do. This is the best of the best out there and you should be following us rather than us sort of adapting and sort of um, really sort of uh, like square round hole kind of thing, trying to adapt things from other markets to us. We want to be sort of almost find our own in marketing sort of nonsense speak blue ocean space where no one else is um, and really, really create our own market, create our own ocean and really being in control of our own destiny because we've done that and it's genuinely world class. Um, it's a big, big objective and it's not going to happen overnight, but I think we have to have that because uh, ultimately sport is about sort of performing, excelling and contributing to a team. And if everyone's got that mindset, we'll be in a very good place. 
And you said that your goal was to make beautiful memories. So I was wondering, you have the most fan groups of any CPL team, Dames of Your, Green Lions, Generation XI. So how are you working with them to get the club's message out? So the key thing in the mission is that the memories are authentic and it's focused around authenticity. So probably the reason we have so many fan groups is we have people coming and approaching us and saying, this is how I follow football. Um, this is what I want to celebrate and this is what I want to be about and represent. And we can be a conduit and help them amplify that. So the authenticity in our fan groups and, and what they take and, and not what they take, sorry, what they take from us, but what they give to the stadium and, and really, really push out is massively important. Um, we want them to drive fan culture. Um, it's not about us manufacturing it and making it very plastic and artificial. I think um, you guys up in Halifax, probably better than anyone have done that um, in that it's a full stadium, it's bouncing, the town is there, um, the club is community. That's really, really phenomenal. And uh, Derek, Matt, all of the team up there really, really need to be uh, congratulated on what they've done. Um, and we aspire to be that and, and ultimately aspire to be more as well. And, and, and they aspire to be more. So that's what's going to drive this league and soccer in Canada forward. Yeah. So you have some unique challenges being kind of in the Toronto area. I'm, I'm originally from Toronto myself. Um, but be that, I mean, you've got a lot of different sports uh, a lot of different, you know, uh, sports, not even in soccer. And then you also have the, the competition with uh, TFC um, in the MLS in, you know, the same general area. So, you know, how is that, how is that uh, challenging to build an audience? Because obviously the CPL was in his first year. Um, I, I think from my perspective, uh, it seems like it, was, it went really well. Um, you know, and it kind of garnered, you know, speaking as a CPL as a whole, it garnered a lot of interest and in some cases more than, more than I think uh, was anticipated. But, but you're in, in, in the market where, where there, there is that, that kind of competition with so many other sports and mm -hmm. a lot of traffic as well. Yeah. So how do you, how do you stand when, uh, when you're looking at all that together? So... I think first off, we're no different to um, any metropolitan city in North America. Um, I, I've spent the vast majority of my time um, since coming across from the UK and New York. Um, we've not got one of everything, we've got two of everything. Typical, typical, typical New Yorkers in terms of like, it, it is a completely saturated market, but um, clubs have to not sort of fight against each other for market share, they have to carve out and, and sort of really take ownership and create their own destiny um, and their own sort of place in the town, in the city um, schedule. So I think we had looked to do that with uh, Friday night football and bringing games to Friday nights, um, having, uh, and this sounds terrible because I've forgotten because I've not had a, a real detailed look at the schedule. I've turned the alerts off on my phone as I'm sure everyone has um, because it's just a bit of a kick right now because we're all missing it. But um, like, yeah, we've, we looked at Friday nights as being ours. Friday night was come to York Lions Stadium. Um, we're on mass transit. We're, we're on the subway line there in Toronto. Um, come from the pub outside your office to the pitch um, and get down there, enjoy it, be part of something and turn it into a spectacle and a party. Um, we also wanted to do that so that we weren't competing with youth soccer in uh, York Region in, in GTA. We are in York Region and with York Region Soccer Association, there are 15 youth clubs alone. Um, and all of those guys were quite often playing on Saturdays and Sundays at the same time as we were. We want to be aspirational for all of those kids and we want them to come and see us. I think, again, I'll point to some of the things that Derek's done up in uh, Halifax and in Nova Scotia, chatting to your local associations and making sure that there's not clashes with uh, Wanderers games. I think mm -hmm. that's a phenomenal initiative. I think the availability of pitches and just space in the day might make that a challenge um, for us. But the move to Friday nights was certainly something that uh, we felt was going to address that. And it was also going to um, get people to, to resample 
um, the atmosphere and resample what we could provide. Um, because from chatting to the staff, um, and I can't say too much on this because I wasn't there, but from chatting to the staff in our office, um, they felt we, we didn't do a good enough job. We didn't raise the bar for CPL in year one. And we've got to always aspire to do that, move on and progress. And you were just talking about how there's so many um, youth cl- like clubs slash academies. But is it a goal for York 9 to eventually have their own academy? Or are, is that not re- or is that just or are you not really thinking about that at this time in just year two? So I think um, one, we've just got to all owners within the league and, and everyone within the league has to be very, very careful with resources. Um, academies are very expensive um, yeah. because academies are performance soccer systems. They're not participation soccer systems. So if you're going to run academies, my view is that, and, and this is just me, not anyone from the uh, ownership at York 9 or, or from the CPL, if you're going to run academies, they have to be sort of uh, merit-based in how you get in. You have to be good enough. Um, it has to be sort of an investment in players that you're going to bring through to the first team and sell on. Um, I think we currently would need to invest a lot of money uh, there in uh, rental of pitches. Um, We would have to invest a lot of money in additional coaching staff. We would have to invest in kit, all of these things um, to run an academy that runs up a very, very significant bill. Um, The league has invested in League One Ontario um, and Canada Soccer Business, which is effectively owned by all of the clubs within the CPL own League One Ontario now. And that could be a better pathway Um, for many of the guys that I have in my first team. That could be a better pathway for guys to get minutes um, and and sort of play and develop there and come up to York 9. Um, I'm still learning about sort of the intricacies. And I think when you go to any new country, any new region, any new place in the world, You've got to understand the local ecosystem first before you can make sort of big judgments that are going to affect the long term future. So we've got to delve into that a little bit more. But um, I think what we are committed to doing is giving young talent a chance. Um, And we've we've certainly done that over the first year of the club. Um, Jimmy's had a phenomenal track record in developing uh, someone like Maury Dona, who's on Mm -hmm. the older age bracket of someone to sign their first pro contract. Um, but has really excelled, made the right back spot his own. Uh, we re- I rewarded him, and Jimmy and I had a chat about it, re- rewarded him with an extension through the end of 2021 recently. Mm-hmm. And similarly, yeah. on, on the on the left side of the pitch, with I Abzi. think, yeah, you, right? you're, you're going to struggle to find many people who wouldn't take Abzi as the sort of consensus best mm-hmm. left back in the league. Yeah. Um, and so he's a guy that we really feel can go on and play at the next level. Um in Europe, actually, and right up to the highest levels, his physical attributes, his strength, his speed, mm-hmm. his, his work on the ball. Um, he, he really, really is a guy who we feel could excel at the next level and, uh, and move on there. Okay. Yeah. So regarding Canadian talent, and uh, there's obviously some rules in the league of, you know, having a certain number of Canadians and a certain number of uh, minutes for, for young players. U21s um, to be exact. Yeah, what are you what what are you excited to to about uh, who's developing this year that that we may not know about in terms of Canadian talent and and youngsters coming? Yeah, so um, we've got some big news on the uh, under twenty one talent side, um, okay. and and you guys are going to be the first to hear it. So um, we are we are hoping that um, we'll announce in the next. Uh, few days the first sale of a, a player who was one of our under 21s last season um to a top division in europe um so as of um at this moment it should be tomorrow but hopefully that we've not had to ask you guys to press pause on this and pushing it out yeah but um emilio estevez will sign for uh, ado den haag in the uh, eredivisie in holland oh, wow. um, and, and so he will be the first um, player for a many club in the CTL to go to a uh, top division in Europe. Wow, that's, wow, phenomenal. that's huge. So there you are, Jack. Thank you very much. But Jack, you get to uh, you get to break the exclusive, buddy. I think uh, your commitment to the game up here may be uh, 
someone like you deserves to break that one tomorrow and get the first interview. Thank you. Um, and I know Emilio Estevez was a was really a, a big rising star, and Jimmy Brennan um, worked with him in the off season. If I'm correct, was it your pl- what, were you planning to keep him around longer or was he always going to go in the future? I think you, you always plan to keep talented players. Um, but, I mean, the way the world is right now, when someone comes in with a, an attractive offer, you have to listen. Um, yeah. And I think this is just a fantastic move for Emilio as well. Um, yeah. The opportunity this gives him to go touch wood, everything being well, uh, travel as soon as possible, get a full pre-season in with his club um, yeah. and do everything like that sets him up with the best possible chance of success. So um, really, really uh, great news for us all. And uh, he goes with the absolute best wishes of, uh, of everyone at the club. And I, I can't speak highly enough about the work that uh, Jimmy in particular has done with him over the last uh, 18 months or so um, to, to make this sort of move a reality and a possibility for the guy. Yeah, that's so nice yeah. to hear. And um, and so and so you're saying that that the clubs in Europe are scouting uh, here now because um, you talked about being a global benchmark. So are you starting to see that you know you have scouts going out to, to different areas, and you're also seeing scouts that are that are interested in some of the players that that are in the CPL? Yeah, for sure. I think um, the Tristan Borges move was definitely something that uh, moved the needle on that, and and really really got more people going, okay, what's going on here? Um, yeah, just, but, mm-hmm. Go on, Jack. Oh, I was just, sorry. Um, I was just going to say because Joel Mar- Waterman went to the MLS as well. So MLS is yeah. definitely one of the bigger leagues that people pay attention to. For sure, for sure. And uh, all of these moves are, are just phenomenal and speak to um, the potential that Canada has as a soccer country. I think if you look at, might have been ESPN, but I can't remember whose list it was. I know I read it on ESPN, their list of the uh, top prospects yeah. under 21 in world football. You've got two Canadians sort of really, really heading that up. Um, so it's it's certainly an interesting time for soccer in the country right now. And uh, I think there are, I mean, I feel that we have, and I just look at my board right now, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I, I feel we've got eight, nine players within our squad um, that with a good season under their belt have all the potential in the world to um, move to the next level, whether that's MLS, whether that's uh, top divisions across in Europe. Um, mm-hmm. I really, really feel strongly about the number of the guys within our team and, and the potential they have. Yeah, that's yeah. phenomenal. And it was and it was nice to see in the Canadian Championships um, you know, I think I think a lot of people were surprised at, at how competitive it was, you know, when the CPL teams went up against the um, the MLS teams and uh, and made those, you know, very, very close games in a lot of cases. Yeah. And yeah. looking at your roster and a lot of the new CPL teams roster, I think they will be able to beat a lot of the MLS Canadian teams. I think they will get farther than they did last time. Yeah, we, we've got to hope we can. Um, that's going to be our most immediate benchmark and challenge for us. Um, but equally, year one, did we have a little bit of an element of surprise for MLS teams? Um, so um, we've just got to be prepared that when those games come around, um, mm-hmm. I can only speak for my club and, and York Nine, but we're ready to, to go out, perform and, and give it our all for uh, the fans and the ownership group. Um, yeah. I, I really think we've got a great, great group of players um not just of players but of personalities and people too um there's some really really um good good people within that squad and within that environment and uh, that makes it very very powerful when we're all moving towards the same objective yeah and you were talking about how can how canada has a great um opportunity opportunity to be a big soccer country and I was just wondering, where do you think Canadian soccer will be in 10 years? Like, whether it's, like, almost qualifying for the World Cup, if you're qualified for the World Cup, group stages, winning a CONCACAF CONCACAF Champions League. So where is your take on that? Where do you think Canada will be in 10 years? I think if you looked at uh, the Canadian national team with the guys coming through, 
particularly <laughs> um, like Jonathan David, Alfonso Davies, okay. you've probably got two players that most of like the big five in Europe would kill for in their sort of, not just in their yes. squads, but mm -hmm. I think they would, they would pretty much make most starting 11s um, yeah. for any international team across sort of the big five in Europe. Um, so there are some other pieces that need to come together, um, but there are other guys performing well at MLS level. Um, there are guys performing well within the CPL as well. And I think the CPL is going to be a phenomenal sort of feeder and accelerant to the growth of the Canadian national team um, because ultimately there are 160 jobs in professional soccer in Canada that didn't exist <laughs> before this group of owners invested yeah. and, and, and built the league. Um, yeah. So that can only be a great thing. And if you've got 160 more playing opportunities and jobs within the country, um, that's a larger playing pool, that's more competition, and that's only going to drive standards and push things further. So. Uh, I think Canada's in a in a great spot to keep on going and uh, really, really continue their evolution as a soccer nation. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to get into analytics. Um, I understand you're very into into analytics, and soccer analytics in particular is a developing field. How did you get into into soccer analytics? And can you explain what like what what that, yeah. what soccer analytics means? Um, so, so like any analytics, um, it starts with good data. Um, and my sort of really journey into soccer analytics started on the data side. Um, I joined Opta in late 2010, um, initially mm -hmm. within their rugby department. Um, rugby mm -hmm. was my background, um, playing very badly, uh, and then coaching for a number of years. Um, I was very fortunate. I was assistant coach of the um, Scottish Rugby League team um, went to the Rugby World Cup in 2008 in Australia and mm -hmm. really, really enjoyed my time within the sport. And it was probably that trip to Australia in 2008 that made me sort of really jump up and say, OK, a career in sport is where I want to be. Um, I was working in IT and high technology and sort of emerging technology, high tech, high tech mm -hmm. recruitment, really, um, at the time up in Edinburgh and um, pivoted out then went and worked for uh, Puma's UK and Ireland licensee, uh, Genesis Sports, for a while. Worked across uh, their sort of signing of clubs, of universities, of teams into uh, Puma apparel contracts. And from that, really, it morphed into a, a role with Opta, which took on board the best of my sales experience from uh, recruitment, from my work with Puma, and my passion from sport and coaching with Scotland Rugby League. Um, I did a lot of work with leagues, with federations, with broadcasters in the UK, um, selling up to data um, and, and speaking to them about how they could use up to data to tell stories. Uh, that coincided with me meeting my now wife um, here in New York at my, my cousin's wedding and sort of uh, maneuvering a, a role out here as we launched our partnership with Major League Soccer. And through that, really, and, and working with taking what I'd learned from coaching and sort of limited experience playing um, to then got to work with some of the best and brightest in sort of the sports analytics and, and data world, to be honest, and, and really took advantage of every opportunity I could there, um, working with MLS GMs, working with MLS head office to build up my knowledge and, uh, and really, really just leverage things into the role I'm in now. A um, couple of mm -hmm. twists and turns along the way, as we sort of said earlier, but um, I, I firmly became a believer in sports analytics because it, I found it hard to disagree with it um, when you're actually able to use evidence to present an argument and, and back up your points and your analysis. And it wasn't just sort of generalizations that were spouted out. And um, it, it fitted very well with the US sort of sports broadcast culture as well well let me let me kind of play devil's advocate for a second because you know analytics in something like baseball is very binary you know yes no like it's a it's a walk it's a strike it's you know a foul ball it's it's you know very clear um mm -hmm. when you get into soccer it, it, it seems much more subjective uh because you're you're dealing with much less you know kind of defined points and yeah, I mean, so, you know, it's soccer seems more abstract. So how does analytics work 
in in soccer specifically and you know is it just as as accurate as you know the analytics of you know uh baseball yeah i think it's it's like um it's like any sport i think uh more humans participating increases the risk for human error um and mistakes um if everyone was perfect the world would be pretty boring sport would be really boring um you'd yeah. either have games that were like a hundred nil or they'd be nil nil um because everyone would cancel each other out so it's all about like any walk of life trying to find competitive advantage and edge um and it's not necessarily about being perfect but i always look at it and there's a um a British chap, um, Sir David Brailsford, who's involved with um, Team Sky and British Cycling for years and years, who speaks about marginal gains. If we can get sort of 0.5% better every day, the cumulative effect on that is, is pretty significant. So if we can take that philosophy into the analytics side of it and look at some things um, that, that we actually know that the eye, t- the eye test will tell you someone shooting from the halfway line is not a high probability chance they'll score just because David Beckham did it. Wayne Rooney's done it. These kind of things like they are exceptions to the rule and they are very, very low probability events, but Mm -hmm. with expected goals, with some of the things that we look at in analytics now, we can spell out where better shots come from um, and where, what better shots lead to in terms of goals. So, I'm very much a believer that there are different aspects of the game we can break down. And as we get more sophisticated, better and other elements, we can then start to look at things in more of a flow state and look at how uh, the different positions on the pitch depend on each other. Um, Even in the last five years, uh, maybe slightly longer than that, the introduction of tactical cameras and tactical video exchanges where you can see all sort of uh, 22 players on the pitch at one moment. So you can see player shape and attacking sort of things there. Um, that's a, that's right. That was new. And then you combine with that tracking data where you can see everyone moving around like pro Evo or sort of FIFA or football manager, um, just as dots, that tracking data becomes really powerful. And then when you're now getting tracking data, where you're looking at body pose and sort of the angle someone's legs at, um, Statsbomb have something called goalkeeper ragdolls, where they basically draw a stick man of the goalkeeper in where he's diving, where his hands are. Um, and that sort of helps them evaluate goalkeeping performance and look at expected goals. All of these kind of things are really, really interesting as you look at the evolution of, of soccer analytics and even the evolution of analytics in, in other sports as well. Um, it's as computing power, um, as computing cost, um, as sort of even storage and, and volume of data um, changes. It's about sort of finding useful application of all of this stuff and translating it um, to your coaches to make changes um, becomes really interesting and, uh, and really important. And do the players yeah. wear like wearables uh, that, that measure their movements and stuff during the game or just in? No, so we, um, we'll wear them in both. Um, so we have a, um, as a result sort of my connections within the industry, we signed a three-year partnership, um, which we'll formally announce. We would hope to have done it by now, but we've not been able to get a uh, nice and wrapped up uh, bow on an announcement with Statsport, our GPS provider. So uh, that's the sort of the black or white sports bras that you'll sort of see the guys wearing that have a, um, it's a, it's smaller than your mobile phone, but sort of uh, probably around the size of a credit card. Um, Actually, in fact, it's smaller than that now, um, that sits in their back neck that has a a gyroscope, an accelerometer, lots of other pieces of technology and that it links with a heart rate monitor um, as well. And so we're able to use that in training and in games um, to look at players. And for us, that's really important because where we are with CPL right now, we only have a 23-man squad. Um, So the most important part for our our GPS wearable is in um, return to play and making sure we as 
we have what's really termed as, as many of our dollars out on the field as possible and not in the training room. Um, so that we're being very, very efficient with our, uh, our spend and our, our, our salary cap. Um, the worst thing that can do in the season is injuries. So if we're able to monitor um, load and things like that with players, we can make decisions on when they train, how much they train. And, it, and it's not just he's had a tough week. We're looking at sort of where we need to get their heart rate and for how long um, to do the work that we need to. So the guys had the first crack of that when they went down to Orlando for preseason. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were, I think they were liking it because the squad are competitive. So they want to know who's made the most most sprint high speed or sprint efforts, who's run the furthest, who's done these things. So that's great for us as well to drive uh, the competitive level within the squad. Okay. okay. Um, I want to ask you uh, what, um, what analytic is your favorite and why? Um, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily say I have a, a favorite or one single metric I look at. Um, it, it genuinely is about a, a holistic view. Um, you can be as, as cynical a, a, as you want on some of these things in analytics, but um, ultimately, uh, some of the things that we I like to look at are in our sort of underlying performance tables um, rather than the league table. Um, so using sort of various metrics that are sort of thrown together to create this one thing. We look at if we're over or underperforming by a, a number of goals for, goals against, or expected points across the season. And that gives me a, a fairer gauge that in time where I think we'll be trending off the back of things. So okay. how is the team gelling? Because you said they're very competitive and that is a good sign, but how is the team gelling and how are they working well together? Yeah, so they've been, uh, they, they've been great. They're a good group. Um, they went down to uh, Florida on, I want to say, uh, I'm losing track of my dates now, but I think it was the 4th of May that the guys went down to Florida for pre-season and, and they were there until they were sort of recalled and we flew them back early because yeah. of the COVID outbreak. But um, So the guys got a little bit of time down there together. They were in little um, pods of four, rooms of four all together and so they got time to sort of bond, meet each other and, and catch up a little bit down there. Um, the usual sort of characters, um, I think... Uh, Dichara, um, in particular, uh, Petraza, Manila, um, our little uh, sort of uh, Canadian-Italian trio um, kicking around uh, in Orlando together. Equally, uh, Adrian uh, Ugariza and uh, Gabriel Vasconcelos, Brian Lopez all uh, hung out quite a bit together down there as well. Um, and uh, right now, obviously, we've got the guys that are sharing the house together in Toronto with uh, Fugo Sagawa, um, uh, Wata, and uh, Gabriel Vasconcelos are all together. So there's a, yeah. a Japanese-Brazilian house uh, somewhere out the back of Vaughan right now um, in lockdown, enjoying things. Yeah. So I just have a question. So Brian Lopez and Gabriel Vasconcelos come from some of the biggest South American... Yeah clubs um in the game because gabriel vasconcelos came for from corinthians which is a big um south american team and same with brian lopez but he came from racing so how pleased are you that you got um brian lopez and gabriel vasconcelos from them and yeah. you you'll be making more deals with them in the future I think we certainly, first off, we certainly like, like to make more deals with big clubs in South America. There's no two ways about it. Um, Racing are sort of known as one of the top clubs in Argentina for developing talent. Um, and equally, Corinthians are as well. I mean, the fact that who we're getting in a player in Gabriel, I mean, he made his debut for the first team at Corinthians at 17. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, a, he's a player who I think we can really, really uh, offer some opportunity to restart his career and uh, get back on track and really, really go get games and excel um, and show people what he's all about. He was, uh, from what the guys are telling me, great to see in, in pre-season. Brian's 
Brian's slightly different. Brian's much younger um, and sort of comes into his, his journey. And, and all of the squad are much younger this year. Um, the players we have rostered on right now, I believe the average age is about 24 years and three months. Um, mm-hmm. So we have got significantly younger as a squad from uh, last year to this. And we feel pretty confident in uh, what we've brought in, where the squad currently sits. Um mm-hmm. With a couple more bits of business to get done, I think, uh, like I said, we've chatted about Emilio leaving. Um, we'll hopefully have a replacement signed for Emilio um, mm-hmm. very, very quickly. Um, and then also looking at adding our final under-21 player. Um, that'll probably happen and be confirmed around about Wednesday of this week, I'd imagine. We're able to get the, the, the sort of the third... Uh, under 21 player confirmed in the okay. squad right now as well yeah because that was actually going to be my next question for you how are you dealing with that but it seems like you've got that all under control got that um, under control i mean we're, we're really happy to get ij haley and uh, max ferrari uh, max okay. has been settling in really well and chatting to jimmy and uh, paul stolteri they were very happy with the progress he was making um i think like all guys coming in it's his first pro contract there's an adjustment period for the first sort of two, three weeks um, training in Toronto. Um, but he's really fitting well into the environment. And he's represented the club really well too, actually, with the uh, ECPL and uh, the FIFA tournament at the start of the year. I think uh, he just about went unbeaten. Um, but he was, uh, unfortunately, on the, the losing side of a few results as an uh, esports player. Um, got beat and came up against some tough competition there. Okay, and so, I'm just wondering, because uh, obviously Aisha Haley was a TFC player now, and Ryan Telford was also a TFC player, and Mori Donor and Max Ferrari both claim, came from Aurora. So what is your relation, relationship like with TFC and exact same with Aurora FC? So with Aurora, um, they're another one of like these 15 or so clubs that we have within the uh, York Region mm-hmm. and York Region Soccer Association who are brilliant partner and associate clubs for us. Um, They could not be uh, better. They have come out in fan days and uh, multiple other things. Um, Mm -hmm. Max and Maury have done some uh, webinars and sort of Zoom calls with the Aurora guys, I think, during this lockdown as well. Um, Aurora, fantastic support. Um, Ija obviously came from TFC, um, Mm -hmm. from their academy. And... There, there is nothing like really probably too much to the disappointment of people scandalous or, or, or anything in the relationship between us and TFC. Um, we both offer opportunities for uh, young Canadian players to develop. Um, and it, ultimately it's up to uh, players what they feel is the best route forward for them. Um, TFC have a very successful academy, they have TFC2 and then obviously the first team um, for players to develop in. Um, But with the under-21 rule um, and things that we have at our disposal as a league, there's also the opportunity for people to come into a a senior, a first team environment from a very young age um, and play and get minutes. And that's how they feel is going to develop them best. And that's how the discussion went with Ija and, uh, and him joining the club. Okay. okay, and um, so Ryan departed uh, this season. He was part of the inaugural season, and he scored the first goal dramatically, um, and he was one of the highest-profile CPL players coming into season one. And the th- your three main goal scorers, um, your three high school scorers, Rodrigo Gattas, Simon IG, and Ryan Telfer, uh, those were your three main or most goal scorers so are you worried that all of them have gone because your attacking is very strong this season but are you a bit worried that um you overturned like mo- pretty much all of your attack um, yeah so we, we we had to make some changes there um ultimately when ryan didn't re-sign um it gave us an opportunity to have a little look and take stock of things um rodrigo i think had, uh, by the time i had come in discussions with Rodrigo had finished in late December. Um, he was already on to, to something else. 
Um, and Ryan obviously uh, went and signed his contract in Cyprus. Um, it, Simon was a slightly difficult situation um, because he was signed on with the club for this season. Yeah. Um, and I just had a very, very um, honest chat with Jimmy and Jimmy and I discussed it and what did, what did we feel we needed moving forward. Um, and we were able to come to an agreement with uh, Simon's representatives and with Simon um, to sort of go in a different direction as a club. Um, I can't speak, I don't really know him, but having dealt with his people, Simon and what Jimmy and everyone else in the squad has told me, you couldn't get a better person than Simon within the squad environment. Um, but we just felt we had to make a change. And with Yako, Adrian Ugariza, Nicholas Hamilton, but also the domestic side of it with Michael Petrazzo coming in as well. Uh, Gabrielle can certainly play up the top in a front three. Um, other players that, that we're looking at as well. Um, we, we feel pretty confident in our, um, in our choices and what we've done. Um, I think if, if we had stood still and um, nothing had changed, people would have been frustrated. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, unfortunately, the gap between, yes, we had a good first year and we finished third, but the gap between third and seventh and the gap between second and third, um, not a great sort of deal of significance between the two gaps. Um, yeah. And so for us to sort of really be challenging for top two, um, we had to make changes um, and we had to really, really look at a bit of variance in our model and, and what we're doing there to really, really take it on to the next level. Yeah, well, Petrasso seemed like a great pickup. Um, how important was analytics and scouting in, in picking up him and, and Arnone? Uh, was it more about the analytics or more about the scouting? Or So um, both two players that were very well known uh, domestically. So in some cases, the what you see and the volume of games you watch and see in person and everything else, Yes, we're obviously going to cross-reference on the analytics side. And um, Matt Arnone was a very significant contributor to you guys up in Halifax last year. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted uh, depth and competition at centre-back um, for Roger and Luca. And Matt coming in, um, it was just the right opportunity. He's a local guy um, for us. Time to sort of get home, play in front of family, do those things. Haven't been on the road for a year, so... That was a decision that made sense. Equally, Michael was, um, when also, you look at the yeah. data and analytics on Michael, Michael's the sort of best and most productive player in terms of uh, chance creation and, and, and assists last year for when he was um, fit, healthy and on the field. So right. we've Michael's a player with huge potential. He's obviously already played in England. He's already been involved in the national team. Um, I, I feel he can sort of either go back again and play in the UK should he wish or but uh, I really think if Michael Petrazzo is on top form um, he's in the discussion for the Canadian men's national team without a shadow of a doubt absolutely mm -hmm. yeah and I wanted to ask you about the Heroes Initiative so could you tell us a bit more about the Heroes Initiative how it works and how it proceeds from the benefit of Mackenzie Health and the merchandise with the album album yeah so um we just felt right now with everything going on, um, we needed to single out and really, really praise um, the, the healthcare heroes, the frontline workers yeah. within our community um, who are doing sort of selfless work um, in hospitals, um, on the front lines, doing everything that we need to go about our daily life um, and not really being recognized. So we needed to, and we wanted to as a focal point in our community, make sure we were saying thank you, um, make sure that we were showing that the team, the region, the wider soccer community, um, we are united behind this cause. Um, and so it was a very ultimately small gesture, um, but one that was very easy for us to make, um, to recognize these people that are doing so much right now. Um, we chose um, Mackenzie Hospital, Vaughan Mackenzie Hospital, um, as a sort of beneficiary uh, of everything there, uh, because the Borders are a family, have got a, a long-standing relationship there, and have 
um, and actually donated millions over the last number of years um, to, to that hospital and some of their initiatives. So um, it's, of course, very, very close to ownership's heart. Um, and we just felt that it would be something that we could do to really shine a light on the situation. Um, more than anything else, just say thank you and show that, yep, we're a community, we're united and we're all in this together. Um, I think all of the clubs have been phenomenal in their communities in the first 12 months, um, first season of the league. And so it was just our, our sort of effort in um, continuing that within our own market. Yeah, I think you've done a great job with that. Um, did you have a question, Andrew? No, I, th I think uh, I think that's pretty good. Um, okay, I, you know, had, I was just hoping yeah. that, uh, yeah, wondering if you knew any, anything about when when the CPL would be coming back or, you know, How any news on that. Up? That's what everyone's everyone's kind of hoping to get this season rolling. But um, yeah, I mean, um, all, all I can say is we have uh, a, a phenomenal group of owners um, within the league um, that really, really care deeply about their clubs, their communities. Um, and we have a, a weekly catch up call um, where we're discussing various things about what we can do, what, when, if, but we are very, very much governed by what public health officials do. And the most important thing right now is everyone staying safe. So it's a bit of a, a cop out answer in that when the time is right to do so, we'll be there to take the field. But we, we really have to just encourage everyone to, as people have said, follow the guidance and the guidance of public health officials in your, in your markets. Um, and that'll stand us all in good stead. And that'll mean that we all get back out on the football field sooner rather than later. Yeah. And I just have one more, uh, w this last question that I hope you, because um, I'm really interested in it. I hope you'll be able to give us some insight about this. So regarding the draft picks that you got, um, what is the situation in Billy showcase themselves? Because obviously Corey Ben signed with the Halifax Wanderers, but Corey Ben was very lucky to get a signing already, especially since the um, draft picks have not had a time that they usually have had to to get signed. That usually draft picks get to have a bit longer to showcase themselves. So what is the situation for the draft picks right now? So we, we just continue to monitor our guys, um, and I can only speak for our guys. They'll be um, mm -hmm. very much in our thoughts when we look at return to play, um, when we look at return to trading, um, and we'll make a decision uh, based on where we are with our roster um, at, at that moment in time. Um, mm -hmm. We're very fortunate with uh, the guys that we have, um, and I think the U Sports draft, the important thing in it all is it's not just about uh, short term development, it's about long term development of these players. And actually, the best thing for them may be to play college soccer and to play in the U Sports system for another 12 months uh, before we look at them. Yeah. But the draft system gives us as clubs some protection and ensures that there's not a bun fight every year and we're doing things that are uh, counterintuitive to the long term future and strategy of the league. Okay. Good. And just one question to wrap it all off, unless you wanted um, to talk about anything else. So, if there was any one player in the world you could bring to York Nine that isn't Cristiano Ronaldo um, or Messi, and that's still playing, so he can't be retired, it, um, who would it be, and why? Still playing, can't be retired. Um... Yeah. And can't be Cristiano Ronaldo or Messi. Yeah, I, to be honest, I mean, I got Michael Petrazzo, so I'm not sure those boys get in the team. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I've always been a, I've always been a big, big fan. Um, he's not my team. He's certainly not my team. What he does of uh, Kevin De Bruyne, uh, I think he's absolutely phenomenal. He'd be up there, but. Possibly um, Sergio Aguero, I'd probably go for. I think Sergio he's, um, yeah, I'd probably go for him. Just his uh, goals to games ratio stands out as pretty exceptional in the uh, Premier League, and, and he'd be the one that we'd uh, we'd jump on if he was uh, available. Yeah. And he's, like he's he another another so Argentinian. Like... So we've got Brian now, Lopez. So he's got someone to chat to when he gets over. So we'd be all right. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like you might need to drop Arsenal and. Uh... 
pick up Man City then. I mean, yeah, it's been but, it's uh... been a lean it's been a lean few years. Uh, it's been a lean few years for sure. Um, but Bang Yang, Lacazette, great. Ozil um, was a big fan of Aaron Ramsey when he was with the club, but um, it's not the same as the good old days. If it could be anyone, I probably would have taken Dennis Bergkamp. Um, but I, I just loved Bergkamp. But we'll, uh, I, I'd, I'd be pretty happy if we just throw Sergio Aguero up top. Yeah. Sounds great. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, with us. Uh, we, yeah. we really appreciated this. And, um, yeah, good luck on your season. Hopefully things can, uh, can get rolling when it's safe to get rolling. And we wish you the best. Yeah, yeah thank you again, absolutely. Angus. Thanks very much. No, thanks very much. And thank you for everything you guys do for the CPL and uh, everything else. It's very much appreciated, the light that you shine on it all. And uh, I'm sure when we get up to Halifax to play the Wanderers, I'd uh, love to catch up with you guys and uh, make sure, Jack, that we get you around the, uh, the changing room and get you a signed jersey from the boys. Thanks. I would love that. Thank you so much for that. And I just have to say again, I love your background. I love it. <laughs> it's probably kicked in and out a couple of times. Uh, it got very, very dark here very, very quickly. And so we'll see how it's gone. But hopefully it's all work for you guys. And uh, well, stay safe. Yeah. And I hope to see you both in person soon. Thanks. Yeah. Cheers, Thank guys. Thank you again, Angus. Bye. Bye.